kind of imagine that day to be a little bit like Christmas. Uh, you know how when the kids come running in on Christmas morning and uh, all their uh, gifts are laid out under the tree and uh, as they come in they're kind of for a moment they're kind of mind boggled and uh, their eyes kind of go from you know from present to present to, from gift to gift and uh, they're just kind of trying to take it all in and their eyes are kind of big and they, 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 uh, they eventually uh, they zero in on the biggest present, the favorite present. Uh, I, I kind of imagine uh, your first few moments in heaven being that way that when you first 
Uh, your eyes are first opened up, you're kind of dazzled just a little bit with uh, all the beauty and the splendor and uh, gates and streets and all that stuff. Uh, but once it kind of all sinks in, uh, your eyes go to the big price. Uh, and uh, I want to see Jesus. What, uh, what a day uh, that will be. Open your Bibles with me this morning, the third chapter uh, of the book of Acts. Third chapter of the book of Acts. I want to look at a story there that's uh, very familiar. Uh, how many of you remember this from childhood? Can you finish this one? Uh, you remember what, how, how does this go? Here. Who called these steeple? Somebody said steeple. Let's try again. No, here's the church. Here's the anyway. It's my sermon. I'm right. <laughs> y'all can preach next week and y'all can do it however you want to. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I don't know what that means. That, you know, look like you just excommunicated them all, Martin. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Martin says, here's the church. <laughs> there goes all the people. Tornado hit Martin's church. Uh, you, know. <laughs> you know, when we think about church, honestly, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way we think about church. That, uh, you know, here's the people. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's, how we, uh, that's what we think of uh, when we, we think about church. And we often, uh, when we talk about church, we say to somebody, uh, you need to start going to church. You need to come with me to church. That, that's kind of the, uh, the mindset we have uh, about church. Recently, there was a uh, an article that uh, that kind of got some a little bit of uh, a blog post. Actually, got some people uh, inside of the church world talking a little bit. Some pastors. Uh, someone wrote an article uh, about uh, that they weren't going to church anymore. Uh, that they didn't see the need. That they thought there were there were better things they could be doing. Uh, and and uh, I didn't keep up with it completely, uh, but uh, I followed enough that I think what the guy uh, was really trying to do was just uh, stir the pot a little bit. Uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, read all the responses and all the uh, rebuttals. I didn't even read his whole article. Uh, but uh, I got the impression that he was really just uh, trying to stir the pot a little bit and get people to understand uh, that, that there's more to it uh, than going to church. I, I believe the real challenge for us in 2014 uh, in the church is to move beyond going to church. Uh, and, and coming to church. I, I believe the real issue for us is, is to learn not just to go to church, but to be the church, to do church. Uh, the mistake I, I think that we're making is, is that we have made church into something that takes place inside uh, of four walls instead of uh, something that changes us and impacts us uh, enough that we go outside of the church uh, and, and people actually see the church, see Christ uh, in us. Let, let's be honest, the majority of people that we come into contact with, if uh, all we are is a church inside of four walls, uh, the majority of people won't ever be exposed to that. The majority of people uh, will have no understanding of that. If we don't uh, become the church, if we, are, uh, if we don't do church outside uh, of these four walls, then uh, the vast majority of people, even in America, here in the Bible Belt, uh, will never know church. They, they'll know that uh, it is a building. Uh, again, in, in our community, in this area, uh, it's obvious that going to church uh, is not enough. We have a church on every corner practically. You can't, uh, you know, you, you can't hardly, uh, you know, you could play uh, hopscotch from church to church. You know, just from this one to this one. I mean, they may be, uh, you know, different denominations, but you could pretty well, uh, you know, swing from the door of one church and land on the front porch uh, of another one in this community. But yet, uh, we look around us, and I think all of us would agree that, uh, that, that uh, as sad as it is to admit, as hard as it may be, to admit, as embarrassing uh, as it may be to admit, uh, we're not having a large impact on the community, even with all the churches that uh, are around us, even with all the, uh, the church people uh, that we have around us. And I think much of that problem lies in the fact uh, that we come to church. 
that we have church at, uh, you know, 10.30, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, whatever, uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, uh, all kinds of different hours. We have church, we go to church, uh, but we're not being the church. We're not taking the church uh, out into, as the Bible calls it, the highways and the byways. And so, uh, you know, I want us wanting to look at a familiar story. I've used this text uh, many times. It's one of those that uh, you just can't hardly get away from it. Once you know the story, it's just kind of uh, mind-boggling and uh, one of those that sticks in your mind. Uh, and that's, uh, again, this story in Acts chapter 3, where Peter and John uh, are going up to the temple uh, at the ninth hour. It was the time uh, when, the, uh, when the new Christians would gather uh, for prayer. Uh, and so as they were, they were headed up uh, to a time of prayer, to prayer meeting uh, that afternoon. As they came up, uh, they came across a, uh, a lame man, uh, a crippled man laying outside uh, of the temple. And as they come, the Bible says they saw him and uh, gives every indication that this young man, uh, or old man, we don't know his age, had laid there in that condition that his friends would bring him daily, lay him down so that uh, he could ask for, for a handout, so that he could ask uh, for people to give him money. It was the only way he had uh, to support himself. He, uh, he, hadn't, uh, he didn't have Social Security, he didn't have disability, and uh, he didn't have Internet access to sign up at uh, healthcare.gov. And so he, he was just uh, kind of out of luck. And so every day he would have to go and he would lay there and, and ask for people uh, for money. Been there apparently every day all his life. Um, and, and as Peter and John come up the street, we have that uh, familiar sign. I can almost picture uh, you know, Peter reaching in his pocket and pulling out his pockets and turning them uh, wrong side out and said, but I ain't got nothing. You know, I don't have any silver or gold. Uh, and, and you can almost see the man at, you know, I, I don't know how good your imagination is. I've told you before, my imagination sometimes is, is, is too good, sometimes to the point of being dangerous. Uh, but I, I can see him, you know, sitting there with his can, uh, you know, holding up arms, arms, and, and Peter and John coming up the, the street and, uh, and he sees them and, you know, there's potential customers. And as they, as they walk up, Peter, you know, reaches in his robe and he pulls out his pocket and says, silver and gold have I none. You almost kind of, oh, next. You know, you kind of, and, and then he says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And the man, his legs are healed, and immediately uh, he gets up and goes running down the street. What a story. But I think in that story we learn something, because in that story we see two things. We see Peter and John going to church. Going to church is important. Don't misunderstand the point of the message this morning. Uh, I, I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, over my life, there hasn't been uh, many opportunities. There haven't been uh, many days, and I'm not, that doesn't earn you uh, one thing. I'm just telling you there hadn't been many Sundays in, in my lifetime that, uh, that, that, uh, that I wasn't in church. I, I was telling them this morning uh, back in, in the office that uh, growing up, uh, I, I was allowed to um, you know, some of you, uh, you know, y'all can call social services on my mom if you want to. Uh, but I was allowed to lay out of school ever so often. I didn't have to be sick. I didn't have to pretend to be sick. I just decided I wasn't going. And, and, and basically, as long as my grades were up and, and she knew I was going to be out, so the school didn't call and say, where's Jimmy? And she didn't know the answer to that question. We were good. Uh, you know, and, and so occasionally I would, uh, you know, take a day off. And, uh, you know, we were, they were talking about perfect attendance. And I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Perfect attendance in school was never one of my goals. Yeah. Matter of fact, if I would have gotten to the end of the year and realized I had perfect attendance, I would have been highly disappointed. Yeah. I, I don't know if you'd go through all my years of school and get a report card that there was ever a grading period that I had perfect attendance, let alone a year. It just wasn't my goal. I, you know, it wasn't even my goal to get there on the days I went there on time. Uh, you know, it, you know, it just, you know, it just wasn't that, uh, it just wasn't that important to me. You know, I had to, you know, uh, and, and when I started driving, it got bad because uh, breakfast was way more important than school. I can just tell you that. Uh, you know, and the hardest never has been real fast. And so, uh, you know, uh, it just wasn't that important to me. And it was so unimportant to me that that I mastered the dean's signature so I could make my own excuses. You know, it just wasn't that important to me, and it just wasn't. But let me tell you something. I was not allowed to lay out of church. You know, uh, you know, I was like the guy who said I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church. I was drugged to Sunday school. I was the only child. My mama was Act Teens director. I know more about Act Teens than most of you ladies. You know, I, I got you know, I got my scepter. You know, I, I you know, I you know, I know about GAs and Act Teens. You know, going to church. I'm not saying church. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something. Every time. In my life, again, a few weeks ago when I was out 
and, and I was sick. I'm going to tell you, and I understand the importance of it, and I thank God for it, for those who are shut in, who are handicapped, unable to go. I thank God for the, for the television programming that is available. I, I, I do. Some of it's trash, okay? And, and I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about some of the church stuff is trash and a waste of airtime. You might as well watch Bugs Bunny. You know, you'd get about as much theology, okay? Uh, you know, but, but I want to tell you something. If you've ever stayed home and tried to have church with television, it stinks. They, they, they just, you know, it just doesn't work. It, you know, there's just nothing like gathering with God's people. So do not misunderstand me this morning when I talk about going to church and being church. But if all we do is gather, and if all we do is go, we've missed it. If all we do is meet and we don't become the church, if we don't do church, then we have woefully missed who God wants us to be. And I think that's why this passage is so great uh, a lesson for us. It shows both. It shows Peter and John going to church, and it shows Peter and John being the church. It shows them doing the church. I want you to see several things with me this morning. And, and I'm going to use the old, uh, old quote from Shakespeare from Hamlet uh, as a title this morning. Yeah, you, you remember it in the uh, great, uh, great speech there, to be or not to be? That's the question the church has to ask today. Are we going to be the church? We're going to go to church. Uh, are we going to be the church? Or are we going to be what God called us to be? Are we going to be what God designed us to be? His hands, His arms, His eyes in our communities, in our homes, in our families. Or are we just going to be a moose lodge? Are we just going to be, uh, you know, uh, the, the Rotary Club where we gather ever so often and we have a meeting and go home none the different? Go home and, and make little impact uh, on our community uh, around us. And so this morning, I want you to see several things, uh, I think, from this story that uh, are so important for us to consider. If we're going to be the church, if we're going to do the church and not just go to the church. One of the first things that has to be dealt with is this issue of, uh, of Peter and John to begin with. If we're going to uh, be the church, I do church, and uh, instead of just go to church, one of the things that I think we have to consider here is the the perspective uh, of the church at that time. You and I, you, you may not really catch it when you, uh, when you look at this and it says uh, that on that day Peter and John were going uh, up to the temple uh, to, uh, at the ninth hour for prayer. Uh, but that statement alone is a, you know, for, for a lot of people, uh, especially if they were reading that passage back then and they knew Peter and John, when they read that and saw Peter and John going to church together, their eyes got, you know, they, they had that deer in it. Peter and John, uh, Peter and John were about as different uh, as night and day. Uh, you couldn't find two more uh, opposite souls. Peter and John, uh, you know Peter. Peter was the one, uh, you know, one thing about Peter, nobody ever accused Peter of talking behind their back. Never. Because Peter, you know, Peter was one who, you know, it, it was a really short trip between here and here with no filters. I mean, it just, it ran through his mind. You remember Peter. You know, oh, I'd never deny you. Oh, let me get out of the boat. Uh, you know, Peter was one who just, you know, when, when they came to crucify, when they came to arrest Jesus, he grabs a sword, pff, hacks off the ear uh, of the soldier. Peter was impulsive. John, on the other hand, uh, being the youngest of the disciples, John was one who was more of a thinker. You know, Peter would be the one who was at the party dancing with the light shade on his head, John would be the one over in the corner just kind of taking it all in. Yeah. And, and here they are. I, I, I was thinking about that and I walked through my office uh, a while ago and uh, I want to. I don't ordinarily do this, but I thought it was really awesome. I, I love John Phillips. Had the opportunity to meet him uh, a few years uh, before he passed away. Uh, great man of God, just a, a prolific author. And, and I love the way he described Peter and John's relationship. He said, Peter and John, that was different. Used to be Peter and Andrew, James and John. Now it's Peter and John. Calvary had brought these men into closer fellowship with each other. By nature and temperament, they were different. Peter was a doer. John was a dreamer. Peter was a motivator. John was a mystic. Peter had his feet on the rock, and John had his head in the clouds. Uh, John would outrun Peter to the tomb, but Peter would push John out of the way and rush in. Peter would dash out again, his mind a whirl, and John would walk away thinking deeply over the significance of those strangely ordered grave clothes. They were opposite. Uh, and you get down here, and he sums it up this. He says, before Jesus, before Calvary, they were friends. They enjoyed friendship. Now they enjoy fellowship. Let me tell you the number one thing that's got to happen if we're going to do church instead of be church. We've got to get over some of our petty 
arguments and disagreements. We got to get over some of the things that divide us. We don't all like the same music, and we never will. We don't all like the same temperature, and we never will. We don't all like the same volume, we never will. We don't all like everything. And most of those things, in all honesty, don't matter. I want to tell you something. We need to get to the point in the church of Jesus Christ, and I'm not just talking about Poplar Grove Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ in America today. We need to put aside some of our petty ignorance. That's all you can call it. And, we, and stop arguing over whether you know, the, he ought to have long hair or short hair and this and that. You know, what kind of music and all those things. And realize that people are dying and going to hell without Jesus Christ while we argue over worship style. Right. Right. Now i got to be honest with you. I don't like a lot of music. Y'all know me. I'm opinionated. I'll tell you what I'm thinking. Okay? You know, and there's some music that I just assume they never play again. But you know, let me, t- let me tell you something I've learned. I've watched this happen time and time again. I've seen people, and, and, and I'm just, and, and this is not, I'm just going to, I'm not picking, I'm not taking sides. I'm just using an example here. I've seen people who were, let's say, very, very traditional, for a lack of a better word. I mean, they were King James only Bible. If it wasn't in the hymnal, we're not singing it. You know, don't dare play another instrument other than a piano. Um, you know, all the things that you would think were just, I mean, everything you think of in, in the traditional box. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Don't, don't jump ahead of me. And then their son, their daughter, their grandson or their granddaughter start going to a church who, for lack of a better word, we'll just call non-traditional. How's that? Okay? Who... They didn't meet on the same day or the same time as tradition said. They might use a different translation of the Bible. Heaven help them, they played that old crazy music. But their son, their daughter, their grandson, their granddaughter got saved in that church and came to know Jesus Christ and their life was transformed. And it was amazing how their opinion of some of those things changed. You know what that tells me? What really matters is the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you there's nothing that matters. The virgin birth matters. The resurrection of Jesus Christ matters. The blood atonement matters. And those are things worth fighting for. I believe they're things worth dying for. But some of the things that divide us are just dumb. Peter and John learned to get over it. Peter and John learned to cooperate. Peter and John learned to to work together for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it's time the churches, the church of Jesus Christ today learns to cooperate to win people for Jesus. Let me challenge you with one thought for a moment. Two thoughts, actually. Let me give you two examples, two extremes. Peter and John woke up that morning, and they got together. And Peter said, I want to go by Hardy's and get a ham biscuit. And John said, absolutely not. I can't stand any more greasy biscuits. Not that Hardy's has greasy biscuits. I shouldn't have said that. I ate one this morning. I want to go get a full breakfast. I want bacon and eggs and toast and grits and coffee. I want to sit down and have a whole breakfast. Oh, you crazy. Why are you going to do all that? We ain't got that. Well, they finally decide where they're going to eat. They get done eating and one of Peter says, let's go this way. John says, no, I want to go over this way. Oh, that's the long way. You old hard-headed. You, want it. you just don't believe nothing, do you? And they start up the road and they get near the temple and, and, and they see the lame man laying in front of the temple. And as they come up the temple, John says, don't, don't look at him. Don't say you had never done that. You, you saw it on heaven try that. You saw somebody begging. You saw somebody you thought was going to ask you for money and you done one of these. You've come out of Sam's when them little girls were standing there selling them Girl Scout cookies and you done like you didn't even see them. Don't act like you didn't. John says, I can like you did, don't see him, just keep walking. Peter says, Oh, I got a few extra. I got the change I had from, from, from breakfast. I'm gonna give you. Oh, don't give me. Oh, Peter, you just you hard-headed. Won't you learn to listen? And they've argued since the moment they got up to the moment they got to the temple. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that lame man would have been healed? What in the world makes us think when we're sitting around arguing and bickering over some of the stuff we argue and bicker about that God is going to do anything great through us? 
their perspective of cooperation. They were willing to set aside their differences because they realized they had been saved by the blood of Jesus. They were willing to cooperate. We see their perspective uh, has been changed. Their, their perspective is different. They have a different perspective now because of what Christ has done in their life. I mean, we see their, their, their perspective, but also notice this, the position they demonstrate. This man ha- has been crippled since the day he was born. And, and I think it's so important that we learn what takes place in this passage. I, I, I think this should be the guiding principle, the guiding thing that, that sets us. I, I think it should be the position of this church. I think it should be the position of the church of Jesus Christ because we see in it uh, two important things that takes place. First of all, they walk up to this man and, and they look at him and, and, and they don't walk up and say, hey, crippled man, you know you're crippled? You need Jesus. You, you ought to get right with God. Don't, don't say that doesn't happen. Do you remember the story, the other story of the crippled man when the question was asked? Remember what the question was? Who sinned? Him or his parents? See, we learn two things that are important about doing church instead of just going to church. First of all, we notice in this story uh, that, that they confront serious complications. This man is crippled. Yeah, there, there's no denying it. The Bible says he's been that way since birth. And Peter and John don't ignore that circumstance. They don't ignore that situation. Something needs to be done for this man. And so in this passage, we see, obviously, you know the story. Peter says to him, he says, I don't have any money, but what I, 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 you know, here, rise up and walk. The Bible tells us the man's legs are healed, and he gets up, and he goes running down the street. And so they deal with that complication. They deal with that issue. But not only that, you notice that when he, is, when he is healed, what do they say to him? In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And so we see, I think, two aspects of being church, of doing church, instead of just going to church. They both dealt with the serious complication. There's something that complicates this story. It's really hard to tell someone who is hungry about how bad they need Jesus. Because in their mind, what they need really bad right now is something to eat. It's really difficult to tell somebody who's outside in the cold without a jacket about how much God loves them. Because they're thinking, if God really loved me, He'd get me a jacket. So they dealt with the complication the serious complication, but they also dealt with the spiritual condition. See, where, where, where I'm afraid that so often we miss the boat in the church today as individuals is we get caught up in one or the other. We get so involved in what, what we call today the social ministry. Feeding and clothing and housing. And all those things are important. Again, I've already said it. You know, I, I, it's, you know, there's a saying that says, a man doesn't care how much you know, he knows how much you care. You know, you, it's really hard to tell somebody God loves them and get them to hear it over the sound of their belly grumbling. You know, it, it, it's really hard. So we've got to deal with those issues. And I believe that's the responsibility of the church. You know, we sit around and we complain about what the government does or doesn't do, and yet it's the Bible that tells us that it's the church's responsibility to take care of the widows and the orphans. Love me, hate me, that's what the Word of God says. We have a responsibility to take care, to help in those issues. But I, I, I want to be sure you understand the word serious complications. It's not our job to feed everybody. Some people just need to get a job. I, I'm not saying we ought to just run a perpetual soup kitchen. You know, this man didn't have a stumped toe. This man didn't have a bump on his knee. This man was crippled. The only hope he had was Jesus Christ working through Peter and John. That's why I say serious complications. But if all we do 
You know, if we had the ability to go out into the streets today and begin to walk the streets, and we had the ability to go out and begin to heal the sick, give the blind back their sight, give the deaf their hearing, give the lame back their legs, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the, uh, the homeless, and that's all we did, those people would die lost without Jesus. If we're going to be the church, we've got to see both the complications and the spiritual condition. On the other hand, sometimes we get so caught up in saying, oh, they just need to get right with God. Yeah. That'll, you know, we climb up on our holy high horse and you know, they just need to get, you know, they, they just need to read the Bible and straighten themselves out. You know. you know, we forget sometimes that there are a lot of people around us who don't know what it means to be straight. They were raised in a crooked home by crooked people, and all they know is crooked. They were raised in a home where mama didn't sing, sing them to sleep at night singing, Jesus loves me. They were raised in a home where mama didn't take them to Sunday school. All they know is lying, cheating, stealing drugs. That's all they know. If we're going to do the church, if we're going to be the church, We've got to understand that people have both physical and spiritual needs and do work to meet both. That was their position. Oh, now there's problems with that. I want you to understand that as you begin to try to work that into your life, you're going to run into some problems. One of them is, is seen, we realize in this story. Immediately we see here that when this man gets up and walks, there are people who have questions. They want to know what's going on. What, what happened here? The, the, the problems that are displayed. We, we've got these ancient rituals. You know what that means? Let, let me translate that for you. We ain't never done it that way, preacher. Well, guess what? You know, that's the way we've always done it. Well, have you ever considered you've always done it wrong? I know. Bad preacher. I'll slap my own hand. Have you ever considered maybe you're not doing it wrong? Or maybe there's just a better way? You know. Maybe, maybe there's just a different way. Listen, when you when we, we start, you know, I, I I've I've seen this all my life. You know, I, I I'm not it, it, again, you know, this and a you know a, a dollar will get you a piece of chewing gum. You know, I, I, you know Prices have changed. You know, I've, been, I've been around Baptist all my life. I, I don't ever remember not being around Baptist. You know, all I know is Baptist. I, that's just, you know, uh, you know I, I've told people, you know, some of y'all have been along, around long enough to me. If you cut me, I bleed old Baptist Sunday school green. Remember we painted everything that ugly green? Everything. You know, our walls, our cars, our shoes, everything was that old ugly shade of green. You know, Everywhere you look, that nasty, supposed to be calm, and it was kind of nauseating to me. I, I just never was real fond of that green. All I know is Baptist. I know how we've done it. I know how we're still doing it. And I know if you start talking much about helping others and reaching out for others, but they're not a church member. Please, please. Let me tell you something. People that are not church members need Jesus. And some that are need Jesus. Not only the ancient rituals, but let's be honest. And I, I realize these words kind of seem the same, but ancient rituals and arrogant routines, some of it's just because we, we've always, again, no, we've, that, that's just how we like things to look. It, it, we've kind of, we, we, we'd rather play church than do church. We'd rather play church than be church. We like to get dressed up in our in, in our, our Sunday finest and come in and and sing "Oh how I love Jesus" while the world around us burns. Whew. I got a penny. I want to see if I can hear it hit the carpet in here. We like to come into church and sing our song have our sermons and our classes and our committees and our organizations 
We like to play church, do the thing. Well, we must, be, we must be a good church. Look at all the stuff we've got going on. Look at all the organizations. Look at all the meetings. Look, blah, 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 blah. Hey, why the, 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 the Moose Lodge has meetings. They can draw a crowd. Our job is not just to have, listen, there's nothing wrong with meetings as long as you don't invite me. Nothing wrong with committees as long as I'm not on them. You know, I think all of you ought to be on a committee, you know. And that'd just be just fine with me. But we're called to be the church of Jesus Christ and to carry the gospel to the lost and dying. To reach out to those that are hurting and hungry and, and, and miserable and lonely. That's our job. You tell me, which do you think God's most impressed with? A committee meeting? Or somebody who takes the time to sit down and write a simple card and tell somebody, tell a shut-in, tell a widow lady, hey, I was thinking about you today and prayed for you. Or to pick up the phone and say, hey, how things going? Or to take a few minutes and stop by their house. Maybe go by and pick them up and take them get, you know, somewhere. Take them and get their hair done when you go. Which is God more impressed with? Anybody can go to church. I train my dog to come to church. You get a trained chimp to come to church. God has called us to be the church. To do church. See, if the only church we've got meets at 3476 Poplar Tent Road, we're not much of a church. The church ought to go with you and go back to your office, to your neighborhood, to your family. If what happens to you in an hour or so on Sunday morning isn't affecting the people around you, not just affecting you, it ought to be affecting the people around you. Peter and John went to church, but because of it, people's lives were different. To be or not to be. We're going to be the church or go to church. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Some of you sitting here this morning, you might even be unhappy with me, and that's all right. Challenge you to get outside of your box. Some of you have come to church all your life. That's all you know. You're programmed. You don't have to set your clock. You don't have to think about it. That's the way I am. I'm going to be honest with you. That's the way my calendar works. If I miss church, my, my, you know, this bad weather and stuff, it throws my clock off. I don't even know what day it is. Today's Sunday. It's the day I go to church. Tomorrow will be Monday. We went to church yesterday. The next day will be Tuesday. We're going to church tomorrow. Next day will be Wednesday. We're going to church tonight. The next day's Thursday. We went to church last night. Hey, it's Friday. It's almost time to go to church. It's Saturday. We're going to church tomorrow. Hey, that's just the way my clock works. I'm programmed that way. Most of us are. That's all many people sitting here this morning have ever known is going to church. But it's time to start being the church. Where you work, where you live, that others would see Jesus. You're here today and you say, you know what, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I want to come and I want to kneel at this altar and I want to ask Him to use me to be the church. In my school, in my home, in my workplace, that others would see Jesus. See what He's doing in my life. But someone sitting here this morning, you don't know Christ. You've never asked Him into your heart. You're not part of the church. That's part of what we're here for, is to introduce you and show you how you can know Him as your personal Savior. You're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart. Today's the day. You need to come and let us show you from His Word how you can be a Christian. You've been praying. God's led you here. You, you, you've been saved. You want to be part of this church family. Whatever God's leading you to do, this altar is open today. To be or not to be. Going to be the church or keep going to church as we stand together.